Hello, everyone. Welcome to day two of the Exodus seminar hosted by Daily Wire Plus. Um, we're in Exodus chapter three today, pretty much at the beginning of it. I'll just briefly introduce everyone. We have a new participant today, uh, Mr. Mr. Greg Hurwitz, uh, an author and a man of many other talents. I'll let him introduce himself after I introduce all the people that perhaps you're familiar with from yesterday's episode or episode one. Uh, Dr. Douglas Headley, Oz Guinness, Dr. James Orr, Craig Hurwitz, Dennis Prager, Dr. Stephen Blackwood, Jonathan Paggio, I'm Dr. Jordan Peterson. Craig, welcome. I'm glad you're here. I'm looking forward to including you in the conversation, and maybe you can say a few words about who you are. And Thank you for having me here. I'm a, I'm a novelist, I write crime fiction. I'm a screenwriter also, I write comic books as well, and I'm very interested in narrative and how narrative moves through culture, and particularly archetypes, and studied uh, a good deal of Jung um, as well. And so I've, I've had the opportunity to cross with several of you in the past, and I'm very happy to be engaging with you now, the, the, those of you who I haven't yet. So thanks for having me here. Yeah, well, Greg's a great storyteller, and we've talked a lot about literature in the past. He was a student of mine way back when at Harvard, one of the brightest students I had there, and we've had a very productive um, post-Harvard friendship over multiple decades, and so I'm very happy that Greg's here. And we're on Exodus chapter three. We just cracked it yesterday, and I think I'll start right from the top. Um, and Dr. Blackwood had some comments about a part of the chapter uh, th three, three, that we brushed over lately or yesterday, and but deserves some some more in-depth consideration. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. Now that's an, that's an interesting passage, and Dr. Blackwood will elaborate on this. The word phenomenon is linked is etymologically derived from the Greek word phainesthai, and that means to shine forth. And that's a, a concept worth considering because you'll note if you look at how you attend to the world that some things attract your attention, they beckon to you. Sometimes that's because you can voluntarily find things meaningful, so you're imposing a structure on the world, but sometimes it's as if the world is calling to you, it's pulling your attention hither and yon, and and Dr. Blackwood, you had some interesting comments about what happens with Moses next. And Moses looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside, so he deviates from his pathway, and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. Well, and it, it goes on to say, you know, and when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, I was just really, just when we were talking last night, I was thinking about, you know, what are the conditions under which this revelation happens? And what are the conditions under which it happens in our own life, this opening up to the transcendent? And it seems to me there's something very important here in which, you know, Moses is, is, is attending to something. And it's, it's like Aristotle says, philosophy begins in wonder. Mm -hmm. There's this uh, very beautiful moment in which Moses turns aside from where he is to go and attend. And that it's only because he's open to the possibility of turning aside that he sees the burning bush and the revelation that is in that uh, is able to unfold in his life. So he's engaged in some sense in an instrumental activity, right? He's about his own business, but he's open enough to what isn't within his framework of reference, let's say, to note when something is significant that calls to him and then humble enough to pay attention to it. And that's where he encounters God, right? And that's that's definitely worth considering. And so... In that vein, just for a moment, um, I've always wondered, and I have no answer to this, if I were a shepherd, I would see burning bushes regularly. So it takes perhaps a Moses type, which is building on what you've just been saying, to say, hey, wait a minute. It's not it's not being consumed, the bush. It's not burning. There's a fire. It's really attentive. I, I, think, I think it does suggest that. Mm -hmm. Also, could I just say, there's, there's a sense, you know, he says, you know, to take off your shoes because the ground which you're, you're standing is holy. I mean, there's this real question of, you know, 
is everything holy ground? I mean, it's not the world that changes, right? It's our own perception of the world that changes. And, you know, I, I would say there's, there is no moment in life that does, isn't in, in itself actually holy. Not it's a matter of coming to be open to or it to be revealed as holy in your life. No, there's no moment that isn't, is, that is, cannot be redeemed or made epiphanic, whether it's doing the dishes or, you know, doing the laundry or, or, or picking up the usual things of, of, of any day or the usual toils and tribulations of normal life. There's no moment that doesn't have in it the possibility of divine revelation. And so it's... If it's, your shoes are off. Yes, yes. If you have the spiritual, let's say, uh, uh, stance or attunement to let that discovery happen. Yeah, well, that's part of what meditative practice is supposed to exactly. what inst instill in you as a habit. And there's something nourishing about that if it's practiced properly. And that is the relief in some sense of being immersed in something that's outside of you, that's beyond your conception. There's a terror that's associated with that in principle, like there might be terror with a burning bush, but it's also extremely uh, salutary in the most fundamental sense. So a nourishing. So, and when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, and so that, that speaks to your point too, the Lord responds, the, high, the thing that's put in the highest place responds to Moses' response to the call, right? And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here am I. And he said, God said, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. I read in Jung years ago this idea that I found extraordinarily compelling and useful, which was that every ideal is simultaneously and necessarily a judge. And so you imagine that the ideal is something that beckons to you, but you're also, you also pale in comparison to the ideal. And so by apprehending an ideal, you're also simultaneously judged. And the higher the ideal, the more intense the judgment in some real sense. I think that's partly why people are terrified of great art, like Michelangelo's David. I read a great commentary on that. The commentator suggested that the statue calls upon you to be far more than you are. So there's that judgment. And I think part of what happens to Moses here is that he's afraid to look upon God, the God of Abraham that calls people to adventure, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God that calls people to adventure and sacrifice and, and then out of slavery as well, is that ideal that's ultimately terrifying in some real sense. And so Moses hides his face for he was afraid to look upon God. Their negotiation is interesting to me because God sort of comes forth here and lists his bona fides, right? Because he says, I'm your God. I'm the God of your people. Mm -hmm. And so it's, a, it's a very interesting, the back and forth between him and Moses. And so you know, he, he it's sort of, he, he's almost proving the case that he's the God to be set before other gods mm -hmm. by identifying him as the God of his people. And certainly the God to be set bef before other gods by Moses, right. given, his, given his cultural heritage, right? So I'm not only God, I'm not only this transcendent figure that, that you would assume might be behind the unconsumed burning bush, but the more particularized God that's already been identified as part of this tradition. Mm. Right, and, and based on uh, what Stephen was saying, Moses's reaction to what to God's call is also one of attention. You know, he says, "Here am I. Here I am." That's all he can do. He can just, "I'm, I'm here, and I'm paying attention to what is happening." And this phrase is so important that it's repeated in other places in the Bible. You see it in the story of Samuel, for example, who has that same reaction. He hears the call, and all he can say is, "I am here, and I am attending now." And so. So, so it's interesting to see that this, this idea of attention continues mm -hmm. on in the story well, as well. Well, it's, 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 this idea of attention is extremely important because it's easy to think of attention and cognition, let's say, or even rationality as somehow equivalent, but they're importantly different because rationality builds towers of Babel, let's say, and rationality makes presumptions about the world. But attention is a precondition for revelation and for rationality. And attention in, is in and of itself a kind of openness to the horizon of transformation. And 
the more I would say there's a direct connection between being attentive and even being capable of healing in some real sense. So if you're a clinician, one of the things you learn, and Carl Rogers, the clinician, was a particularly potent writer on this notion that attentive listening in and of itself has a curative capacity. You let people unfold in front of you, or you encourage them to unfold in front of you. And that's not even analytic thought. There can be a strategic component of it, but mostly it's, it's just the devotion of attention. And attention also, in some real sense, sheds light on the darkness because we only see what we attend to. And what we don't see or what we don't perceive in the broadest sense is in some real sense, not even there. And so it's, it's also attending, like the Rogerian theory, also it's attending at the level of the nervous system. It's attending all the way down, right? right? Having enough, having sufficient um, confidence in your own worldview to be able to open up and attend and embrace a viewpoint that might be opposing. And it's very interesting to me here that, you know, one of the things that seems to be prevalent in as with the story of Adam and Eve is shame, right? Shame is one of the precursors of this. The first thing is that you hide your face. Mm -hmm. And so the calling is to beckon forth. And they, they, this negotiation that continues is a drawing out and through shame in some regards. Mm -hmm. Cause shame is the first thing I think to overcome about your inadequacies to hold your, your strength of openness in the opposition of a, of something that is revelatory or different to you. And it's a nervous system level engagement. Well, Rogers talked about this Con uh, this concept he called congruence. And he believed that if you were going to enter into a therapeutic dialogos, because Rogers was basically a Christian seminarian, although he became an agnostic, he was going to go practice as a missionary. And so his thought is, is absolutely saturated with Protestant liberal Christian presuppositions. And he believed that in order to engage in a healing conversation, so to actually be able to listen, you had to be congruent. And what he meant by that was that you're your body and your emotions and your motivations and your rationality and your utterances and the way that you cast your attention were genuinely integrated all the way down. And I think part of the yogic practice, so when you practice yoga, people don't know this generally, but the postures, the asanas, those are more like dance moves than they are like the point of the exercise. The the asanas are postures that you learn to adopt so that you can put your body in all sorts of different positions. But once you master the asanas, you're supposed to allow your body, in some sense, to move by itself. So you're trying to take out kinks and pain and all of that, to move by itself like you might when you're dancing, to align yourself properly so you can attain that pose, the cross-legged pose. So you're in a pyramidal triangular position and you're a stack that's integrated all the way up through, you, through your physiological layers. Those would be the chakras so that that revelation can come forth without being impaired by any internal discordance. And it always ends in Shabasana, which is the death pose, corpse pose, right? It ends with corpse pose, you lie still and you integrate and then you you arise again new. Jordan, could I put it slightly differently though? I agree with everything said. And you're talking about the extraordinary, which we should see in the ordinary. Mm -hmm. Stephen's exactly right. I agree with everything you said. But here you have the immensity of something quite beyond any normal experience. So we've got to remember, more than half of the world have a belief that comes from this chapter, because this is different from Hinduism. This is different from atheism. This is different from every other religion. You know, and you know, say, people like Rodney Stark, monotheism, properly understood, is the single most powerful idea humans have ever had. Mm -hmm. And I think we've got to keep the immensity of what's happening here. All you said is right, but here it's elevated to an incredible level. Right, right. Well, that would be the mysterium tremendum of the summum bonum, right? I mean, it's, it's bad enough to encounter the good in one of its forms, but to but encounter the highest idea, good. Even in... Otto's idea you can apply to other religions mm -hmm. and so on. So what do you think specifically this? differentiates this? Well, verse 14 
which we're coming to, amplified by, say, prophets like Isaiah, you have a vision of God here. There's nothing like it. Outside of the cosmos, outside of history, outside of humanity, this is something immensely difficult, different. And I think we've got to recognize the radical uniqueness of it. It's worth pointing out just on that point, uh, just to back up what Oz just said. There's no hesitation at all uh, over the significance of the burning bush. The, the bush is a vehicle for divine revelation. Uh, what would have been much more common in the religious climate of its time would be to treat the bush as some sort of mm-hmm. expression, a form of divinity, actual divinity. In and of itself, yes, just not as a the, pointer to something absolutely, else. Absolutely, just as the Egyptians would take, as we'll see later, the snake as, as something divine, a naturalistic way of understanding mm-hmm. divinity. But, that, there's, no, there's no pause there at all. It's immediately Moses is attuned to the transcendent, attuned to God speaking through an inanimate Object, or well, an animate object, but just a, a piece of a, a piece of nature. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no sense that he's trying to divinize or put sort of ultimate significance in just uh, in a bush, as, as would have been very common and, and has been very common, and put the for the you know, sort of across the vast swathe of the history of religious belief. Mm-hmm. The, these, right, so, go ahead. Just the, these two comments are why, in the final analysis. I I do believe that this is divine text. I cannot think of a natural explanation for the Torah and the radical innovation of monotheism, let alone ethical monotheism, any more than I can think of a rational explanation for the creation of the universe or of the human being or consciousness. It... Just as the creation of, of the universe, to me, argues for the divine, or for a creator, capital C, so does the, the Torah and its radical new God argue to me for a creator of the text with a capital C. So, Oz, part of your point, if I understand it correctly, is that Moses turns to the burning bush, which is a phenomenon that attracts his attention. But then in some sense, and this is to James' point too, he sees through that uh, anomalous event even though it's anomalous and powerful in its own right, and then he sees something behind that that's the source of that anomalous and interesting event. And then in some sense, this extends to a vision that's beyond the cosmos itself, right? Beyond the confines of time and space itself to localize the transcendent, not in the natural world, not in the phenomenal world, but beyond all of that. And so that's part of what makes it terrifying and profound simultaneously that well, to press it one further, I mean, Stephen's right. Uh, he, there's a tension, but he wants to know why, an explanation. Mm-hmm. So that's the signal of transcendence. But when he turns, it's it, not what he sees, that's where I disagree with you, it's what he hears. And surely that's the significance. You see right from, you've got three revelations of God, first to Moses alone, and then to all the elders of Israel, and then to the entire nation. Deuteronomy 4, and it says, you didn't see a form, you only heard a voice. Mm -hmm. And so it's always hearing, Shema. So we don't see. In other words, seeing is what is the normal, foresight, insight, observation. No, the Hebrew is hearing. You think that's associated with the emphasis on the Word as a manifestation, as a primary manifestation of God? Because nothing else can capture God. He's but uh, I, we will see many mm. sites. I mean, we will have to deny the text at some point because the, well, even the description of these feet at the top of the mountain, there are these these images. When when God says, "You will see my backside," there's many yeah. visual images that will continue all the way through the the book of Exodus. Yeah, but so, they're always the, the like or whatever. Uh, it's the feet. You don't see the face, and no one. You know, anyway, I don't want to press that, but Mm -hmm. the word always comes before the image, right the way through. We need to make sense of the end of verse 6 in that case. Moses is hiding his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Mm -hmm. I think there is a theophanic dimension here, and it's suggested by the the burning bush. Mm -hmm. Um, And indeed, that language of the the face um, and the looking. There's a beautiful late novel by C.S. Lewis called Till We Have Faces, 
um, and it's all about the vision of God and the dialectic of trying to understand yourself in terms of the mm -hmm. divine. And it's also linked to this, this theme of shame that, that you mentioned. Um, the philosopher Max Scheler argued that shame is in fact a very important part of human identity. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not just some sort of strange aberration, mm -hmm. but in a way, coming to understand ourselves is a process that quite naturally involves an element of, of shame. And I wonder whether this element of shame here in the face of transcendent goodness. Well, he certainly recognizes himself as lesser than yeah, God, which absolutely. is something, right? Yeah, Especially yes. when you're comparing him to the Pharaoh, yes. who would have, at least in this narrative context, exactly the opposite yeah. problem. Yeah. But these aren't, I don't think these are ultimately opposed to where they, I mean, if what's being revealed here is, is as it were the ultimate order of being itself, you know, God is being revealed as that which is beyond nature, uh, but revealed through these signs that point to that beyond nature. The, that which is beyond nature, and this is where we'll see the great distinction between the God of the Israelites and the God of the, the Egyptians, or the Egypt, as the Egyptians conceive of God is totally bound within the natural. So it's both beyond on the one hand, but signified in what is visual as beyond, but it is at the same time understood through the word. By the way, just that's another unique, uh, I'm sorry, I will belabor this all week. Please. It is another unique thing to the Torah, to the first five books of the Bible that God is the creator of nature and not in it. Mm -hmm. That's the significance of Genesis 1 more than any other significance. There are many significant things, but that is a radical innovation. And we today, in my opinion, uh, the post-Christian or post-Judeo-Christian world is not atheistic, it's pagan. Mm -hmm. We are reverting to nature worship. Yeah, so that's the worship of Gaia, for example. Yep, the notion exactly. that the earth itself is, in some real sense, a self-regulating deity to which we should be subordinate. To the, the right. And well, Jonathan, you had an interesting comment at one point that I remember us talking about, the idea that the, um, the command to man from God was to subdue nature. And your take on that, you took apart the word subdue. And uh, you, the, you took it apart. No. Oh, okay. So how do, so do you remember how the conversation, you talked about the subduing of nature, or the point was to subdue nature is not necessarily to dominate it or even to extract instrumental value out of it, but to put everything in its proper place, yeah. right? To subdue it, to arrange it in a in the kind of cognitive hierarchy and perceptual hierarchy that you characterized as part of this mountain-like structure. And so the, I think the way to, to for me to, to understand it is that on the one hand, there's a sense in which all things, God is beyond all, and that, and that God is, like you said, outside, let's say, or above all things. And then, but there's also a manner in which to the extent that we are connected to God is the extent to which we actually exist, hmm. right? That is how we exist. We exist to the extent that we are, this, that is our source. And so this is this idea of, of, of the hierarchy of beings, you could say, which is the notion that nothing has self-existence. And this is, a, this is what ultimately when God says his name, and this is how many of the church fathers interpret it, that nothing has self-existence except God. Mm. God is the only one who self-exists. Everything else, if once you think it self-exists, then it ceases to exist. It ceases to have any value. And it only has value to the extent in which it participates. Oh, yeah. So is and that it, also the Tower of Babel problem? Because exactly. the Tower of Babel well, is supposed not to be just independent the, of Yeah, the, it's not just the Tower of Babel. Well, it's the Adam taking the fruit. It's like, it's the idea of pride itself, which is that pride mm. is always trying to close yourself off and say, I've got this. I am, right. I am self-causing, I am self-existence. And as soon as you do that, you devolve, you die, because you're not. You're embedded in, in this hierarchy of being, oh, which is ultimately connected to the transcendent source of all things. And so the idea is, all this discussion would be that all things reveal God to us to the extent that they do, but they never give us God completely. They, they are, they are pointers. They are, they are uh, steps in Jacob's ladder, which lead us all the way into the transcendent. But the transcendent always escapes, always, always, you know, uh, recedes in front of our peering eyes. Uh, but that, th those two movements together, I think are super, are very important, at least, at least in a, 
So in my Christian perception, which is both the absolute transcendence, but then also the, the grace of God which flows and which fills the world with his presence and makes all of reality possibly a theophany. And it's only because God is transcendent that he can be present to every ladder on the great, as it were, every link in the great chain of being. Yeah, and there is, and it's not an arbitrary thing. It doesn't mean, you know, it's not that everything can just be holy in every way it is. It, it lays itself out mm -hmm. in these, in these beautiful, powerful hierarchies. And so there are images, for example, the image of a mountain or the man in which God will give the, the, the pattern of the tabernacle, which is the most appropriate uh, theophany. It's the mo it's the way in which you can have more hints to how God reveals Himself in the world, and so they, uh, and the laws are the same. God is saying this is the way, but th the whole world is full of His glory, right? We 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 believe that because or else how does the wor the world can't completely exist outside God either? It doesn't have it doesn't it's not like it's God and then the world has this autonomous existence. It's that it's that God is beyond, but that He 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 out, outpours into reality. That's so different from a modern way of understanding God and religion in terms of this sort of two-tier architecture of reality mm -hmm. with nature and then supernature. And that sort of two-tier structure, which emerges in early modernity, probably a little bit before that, uh, is, is a disaster for uh, people trying to advance a strong case for the rationality of religious commitment, because, as it were, supernature immediately becomes the realm of the spooky stuff. It also know. allows God to float off into space That's in right. some sense. And to be yeah, absolutely, and to be separated from the world of nature and therefore of scientific inquiry. And so it gets relegated, becomes then easy for Bertrand Russell to say, well, belief in God is equivalent to belief in a flying spaghetti monster right, right. or rotating it, teacup. But when do we have this notion of being, right, this uh, I am that will be presented to us, but we understand that being is not arbitrary. Being manifests itself to us in purposes, in reasons. And those reasons become the place where God you know, once you, once you encounter the true reason of something, you are having a little theophany. You're having a, a mini theophany. And so, so the idea that being isn't just arbitrary, just things that exist, but rather it has this natural flow of purposes and meanings. Then all of a sudden, this, 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 the, the image that God gives of the I am, it's like, yeah, he's the only, he is the only one that self subsists and all things in their purposes point towards that. So, um, Something complicated emerges out of that, as if this isn't complicated enough. It's, <laughs> there is this, so one of Jung's critiques of Protestantism was that the critique of Catholicism is that it might fall prey to the authoritarianism that's in some sense implicit in the Roman-like structure of the church and the hierarchy that's there. But his critique of Protestantism, the danger there was that everyone would become their own church and then their identity would become self-proclaimed in some fundamental sense, because with no mediating structures between the divine and the person, it's easy for the person in some sense to usurp the position of God. And one of the things that puzzled me about the recent insistence that people can self-define their own existence is that they're attributing to themselves in some real sense the omniscience, omnipotence, right. and... Uh, omnipresence of God, because their stance is something like, I am that I am. Yeah, that's why it's pride. Yeah, right, right, right. And, and, and I, I really see those things as tightly linked. It's one of the things that's tilted me, I would say, ethically in a more conservative direction, because even in the psychotherapeutic literature, you see this Rousseau-like underpinning, which more or less assumes that Sanity is part and parcel of the autonomous individual. And so there's, there's a Rousseauian element there, there's a Protestant element, and a l classic liberal element. And I fall and pray to that to some degree by thinking of the sovereign individual as the fundamental unit of, of value. And, but then, I, I, and this is partly under the influence of Piaget and, and the theorists of play, and the people who made the case that identity comes out of negotiation, that in order to be sane, which is something other than, let's say, self-actualized in the, in the narrow sense, you have to be positioned in these hierarchical structures. So you can't be sane without a partner, without a long-term partner, let's say. 
Or if you don't have a long-term partner, you better have some children or some parents. And if you don't have them, you better have some friends. And if you don't have them, you better at least have some colleagues and a town and a city and a state and a country all the way up the hierarchy. And that what the sanity then becomes is the symphony-like ordering of that entire structure rather than the autonomous health of the autonomous psyche self-defined also conjuring up the notion that all of that embeddedness is nothing but an imposition in the manifestation of your autonomous self, which is also something that Rousseau would tilt towards, right? But, well, but Jordan, that doesn't come from Protestantism. That goes right back to the early temptation. You shall be as God. Mm -hmm. Now, Protestantism certainly reinforces one extreme. You're right about that. You think, say, of Heine's famous description of Marx, you are a godless self-god. Mm -hmm. yeah, right, yeah, right, 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 because yeah. because that's the alternative. Well, that's a scare. That's a very frightening thing if it's real. And the lack of embedding is what is ripe for manipulation, mm -hmm. right? Because you can move. You can move. This is what we're seeing with sort of you know mob-like mentality throughout the culture across the spectrum because you can move people like a school of fish because right. they're not embedded in something. And that's the tech in the text. That's what we saw at the beginning. Pharaoh. That's what Pharaoh wants to do. Pharaoh wants to reduce the Israelites to potential so that he can then rule over them and manipulate them. He doesn't want families. He doesn't want all these embedded structures which create this normal pyramid. Mm -hmm. and those are alternative sources of power and structure as well that yeah. would... That would but that they, should, they don't have to be... They don't compete. The, the idea that a family is a power structure or, or a structure of, of communion doesn't compete with our relationship with God. It actually mm -hmm. becomes a place where it can happen. Mm -hmm. And that's why the laws, right? When the God gives the laws, they're all modes of communion. They're not just a bunch of like rules or moral rules. They're, mm -hmm. methods, of, they're methods of being together and of, of ultimately loving each other. That's the methods what they're, of negotiation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Pharaoh makes them slaves, obviously. And Hayek would say that's what modern collectivism does, makes us serfs, mm -hmm. the road to serfdom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the same. Yeah, absolutely. Although Hayek's solution, the sort of ultra-libertarian solution, can lead to a kind of atomization mm -hmm. of the individual. And as Greg said, mm -hmm. atomized individuals are easily controlled individuals. Right. So, and the, and the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt. And so he's re-emphasizing the notion that he's attending and also that he's the spirit that's responding to, to their intrinsic and embodied desire to be free of slavery and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. All of that's a delineation of the notion that there's something intrinsically and fundamentally unethical about the enslavement of the, of the Israelites. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, away from tyranny, and to bring them out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me. And I've also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Okay, so now we have the narrative structure of this text outlined here too. And what you see is the... The emphasis on the fact that the current tyranny is unsustainable and ethically undesirable and that it needs to be transcended and that the proper counterposition to that is the hypothetical land of milk and honey. And so that's, well, that's fat and sugar fundamentally. And if you're a hungry people, then mm. that's definitely a vision of paradise. But there's a, there's an archetypal structure to this because we're always moving away from, uh, an insufficient and tyrannical current state, it's not in sync with the horizon of the future and it's corrupted by our presuppositions and our sins in some sense and we're always moving to a better place and that's actually the motive force in life. And if you look at us neuropharmacologically and biologically, what you see is that the systems that fill us with enthusiasm, so that's the spirit of God in the etymological sense, are the same systems that mark our progress towards a, a uh, destination of value. And so there's a direct concordance neurologically between the degree to which you're aiming up a steep pinnacle, your movement towards that, 
proper aim and the degree to which you're filled with enthusiasm and positive emotion. And that also regulates negative emotion, suffering and anxiety. And so you see this fundamental narrative, the fundamental narrative substructure in some sense of perception reflected here. Jordan, with due respect, you're making it up archetypal again, whereas this is historical and it refers to the covenant with Abraham and the promise of land. And that runs right through the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, the promised land. And that's what's being referred to right. here. Right. Well, then I would say that then to your point, that would be a translation in some sense of this even more thinking biologically, this would be a transposition of this fundamental biological drive, which is transhuman, because it's not just human beings that have this goal-directed orientation towards the future. It goes way down the phylogenetic chain, but it's concretized here into geography and territory. Does that seem like a reasonable mediation? Mm -hmm. I have a question here. To, so what are the conditions in the text and, and of Moses in this situation, they call for God's attendance to this. It's not like God was not aware previously that the Israelites were enslaved. So what are the narrative conditions that mm -hmm. cause mm -hmm. this right We now? talked a little bit about this okay. yesterday, about Moses' character. And Moses seems to be someone who's particularly attuned to injustice and suffering. And so there's a call in some sense in Moses to, to respond to this, and it seems that that's part of what alerts God. Mm -hmm. I think that the slaughter of the children is is uh, is also that call. Like we yeah. see, we see in the in the story of Cain and Abel, you see that pattern set itself up, which is that the blood is calling from the earth. You know that this scandal is a, is a call, and so I think that that I think that the idea of the killing of the children is repeated. Um, is as a repetition of already the Cain and Abel story. Is that also, do you but suppose it's there that's in the story because of Christ as well? If yeah. tragic enough things happen to a community, there automatically arises a compensatory desire, which is if the lowest thing is happening, then there's an immediate call for the remanifestation of the highest thing as a as a medicament. But even behind the things you're talking about, Genesis 15, the Lord predicts to Abraham they will go into slavery. And the whole point of Israel is to be the counter Egypt. Mm -hmm. And after they're released, they're never to treat other people the way they were treated. Mm -hmm. There's a tempering too with Moses. I was thinking about your analysis of the meek shall inherit the earth, right? And, and the, the meaning of meek that was always puzzling to me is those who have swords who keep them sheathed. And so it's very interesting to me that Moses, one of his first adult actions is to kill an Egyptian who beat somebody, right? It's like you, he has to have use of the sword mm -hmm. before having the power to know when to have it sheathed to affect transformational change. Mm -hmm. So he's undergone a, a sort of moral tempering in some ways of having access to determine what's too far and what's the right amount that opens him up to That's a revelatory well, moment. That, that definitely fills in a discussion we had yesterday about what happened when Moses killed the Egyptian because it doesn't go so well for him, right? He, and it, it's because, well, in your analysis, it's because he went too far. It was necessary that he had that capacity, but he went too far and he wasn't, we talked yesterday. Well, about are you the fact saying he, he went too far? I'm saying that, that well, he went too far and learned and was punished for it, but you have to go too far to know what is too far. Like so you, you can't so have... You, um, you do feel he went too far. Uh, well, so I, 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 uh, uh, well, I, I, I like what he did. Okay. What I'm saying is, is that you have to go too, you have to know how to use a sword in order to have it sheathed to then bring transformational Clearly. change in peace. Soldiers know best how awful That's war right. is. And so he okay. had to be a warrior first in order to. Right. Understand. And I was just curious because I, it's, it's a very, uh, certainly uh, a Christian commentary is often that he, he, he sinned in killing the Egyptian. And I, and I have never accepted that. Mm -hmm. But, but, it, but. It doesn't have to be a sin to have killed the Egyptian, not to, for us to think that maybe Moses is not exactly a paragon of courage here. I mean, he only, he looks left and right, makes sure no one's watching. It's not exactly resistance of the regime. And only then does he kill someone. And then he, he buries him to make sure no one would know that he did it. And so, well, it wouldn't have been gutsy to have done it publicly. Well, well I mean, one, one could, it one could, suicidal. One, well, one could debate that question, but what I'm, what I'm saying is that there's a moral principle at work, surely, but it's, it's also, let's say, um, 
it's, it's by no means fully worked out. Well, and that's, I, and God hasn't manifested himself fully to Moses by that point either. And so you'd... you'd wait, sus- wait, was it your point? Because if it was, I, I, I'm fascinated. Because you ask the great question, why did God intervene when he did? Mm. For which I have never had an answer. Mm. Uh, and I don't know if there is an answer. But it's a very, very good question. Does the narrative you asked imply any reason for God's intervening then and not earlier? Did you suggest, and if you didn't, I'll happily take credit for this, (laughs) but if you did, I have to give you the credit, that in effect, God was looking for the right person all this time? Well, this touches, and it's a very tricky issue because it, it gets you into a conundrum when terrible things are happening to say, well, they're happening in part because no one will stand up and forestall them. But if you look at situations like the totalitarian states, under the communists, it's certainly the case that people's willingness to not stand up, even when they knew they should, allowed those totalitarian catastrophes to to mount and mount and mount and mount. By the way, was there a, was there a Soviet Moses? I, I can't think of it. Solzhenitsyn Solzhenitsyn was expelled. Yeah. He was expelled though. Yeah. And and uh, so, but, but that's well, an interesting. He it's would an interesting. He, he, well, yeah. many well, of them were killed. Sa- I would say. Sakharov you know. and so on. But, but right, anyway, right. I just want to know: is, is that, that is my that's, that is your well, point? That, well, that's what it, that's it, how no, the narrative looks. No, no, I love it. Like I, I, I'm crazy about it. Actually, <laughs> well, it has to do. With Does it answer that for you in some way? Yeah, I mean, for me, I, so I'm looking at it from a straight narrative perspective of how you make a structure and a story make sense. Mm-hmm. So if we detach ourselves from from the spiritual just for a moment, and what it is is that there's not. There's not a hero who's worthy of having the ability to 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 encounter the divine in a manner that can be transformational yeah. yet. Mm-hmm. So Moses' tempering is the story of, right, he comes sort of from no one, right? He's he's raised in, in, in the way that he's raised, and he also is, is prone to a violent outbreak that shows courage, but it's a younger version of courage. It's untempered. Mm-hmm. And so he pays his penance for that and is finally seasoned, or he's, he's, he's seasoned sufficiently in his suffering to be at a point that he can take notice of what is revelatory mm-hmm. and to engage with it in a manner that's transformational. And so then he's a, he's a, what do they call that, a psychopomp. Yes. He's someone who, like yes. a frog, right? Yes. He can mediate. You're a psychopomp. He can mediate. Oh my God, don't tell me that. That's the worst thing you can possibly be, to exist on that border. And that would require something to come up from mankind, so to speak, and something to come down from God simultaneously, so there's some sort of meeting. And then that becomes that right. person becomes a mediating figure. That's right. right. And that person's in engagement at cultural moments or in the light. Like, people can be psychopomps for different people or for a culture. Well, you think, Dennis, that seems to make sense if you think about it in terms of the prophetic tradition in in the Old Testament is that you get the societies that collapse in and of themselves and, and they're, they turn from God, so to speak, and they continue to turn from God and things just get worse and worse and worse and more tyrannical until someone pops up and is now willing to right. take on the burden so of being then, the voice. This, this wonderful uh, explanation uh, suggests that the old saw, God will act if we do. Right. He won't. He won't. Right. He won't act on, so, a, it, entirely on his own. No. Mm. No. Well, and that, that we, would, we have to prompt his action. That would also interfere in some sense with our free will, and it also makes sense. That's right. With, it would. Yeah. With Dostoevsky's strange comment that beauty would would save the world, because you you could imagine in some sense that what that what Moses is having here when he encounters the burning bush is something like an aesthetic experience. Right. It's profoundly attractive at least perhaps it's not beautiful but perhaps it is and so that beauty is calling to him and calls him into a relationship that then transforms itself into something transcendent but he's also prepared for that characterologically well and what like to oz's point so i don't know if you covered this yesterday but there's so many parallels in the story of moses and the story of creation and the building of the tab the tabernacle also right there's it's it's embedded in the story of genesis and what's very interesting to me is that if you just, if Exodus was the first book, we could say, 
well, if God speaks and there's no one to hear him, does he really exist? If God is right. appears, but Genesis predates it. So this is a story to say, as you're saying, that God is outside of, right? God is outside. That's the revelatory thing. So, That's why Genesis is first. And then there's a parallel of showing this now with the embrace of humanity because right in that Okay, so, so there's this great Jewish commentary that I read. I think I found this in Jung as well. And it was a meditation on the limitations of God. And so it's like a Zen koan. And so here's the proposition, the question. What does a being who's omnipresent, omnipotent, and um, omniscient lack? And you think, well, by definition, nothing. And he lacks limitation. Unless you're a Christian. Right, right. Well, he lacks limitation. I said unless you're and so, so, and, and that was an answer in some sense to why, what was the question? Why God and man are, in a sense, twins. And so, yeah. and it hinges on this same idea is that there, it, there can't be someone who calls unless there's someone who receives. And so. But there is in this tradition, right? If Exodus was first, we're whack with the pharaohs mm -hmm. because Genesis is first. And because Exodus and the story of Moses's flight with, you know, all the water imagery and the parting of the seas, right? It's, it, there's so many mirrors between Genesis and Exodus, including the construction of the tabernacle. And so because Genesis is first is what sets the foundation for the point that you two were, were bringing up. And the, the prophets aren't just popping up. In, in, is it not right, Dennis, in the Hebrew tradition, this is where you have the separation of powers. You have the monarchy, the priesthood, and the prophets. And the role of the prophets is an abiding role. They're the social critics who bring people back to the covenant. Mm -hmm. So the covenantal idea. Do, do they emerge? Are they like Neolithic shaman? Do they emerge by vocation or are they? Are they're they, called, yes. They're, they're called, called by God and you have dramatic call. And you can run away like Jonah. Right. By and the that's, way, that's, that's the most standard. Well, uh, well and who that, wouldn't? It, it right? is. Uh, uh, my sad analogy of, of most Jews is that they're Jonah. God has called us to bring the world to this text. And most Jews have decided to flee. Mm. I think we need to be careful though at the same time about sort of, you know, God's work, you know, nature's work, you know, man's work. I mean, I think the, the overall uh, message, as you might put it, is this is all in some sense God's work. I mean, the creation is God's work. You know, the running away is somehow within God's will. The hardening of the heart of Pharaoh is within God's will. Moses' his own birth and then being put in the river is somehow, I mean, this, this whole, the grand narrative here is meant to be revelatory of the nature of what is most real. And by definition, nothing can fall outside of that. Mm -hmm. But I guess maybe it's a matter of what would you call when you, when you give people, when you grant to people who are your staff, let's say, which is relevant to later imagery in here, their own domain of autonomy. And maybe that's part of this building the, the hierarchy that reaches down from the heavens is that it is all under the dominion of the, the entity that's superordinate, that's beyond being, let's say. But that doesn't mean that each part doesn't have its part to play and its place and that that's actually real too. Yeah, so. uh, I, I take Stephen's point, but the, the first two chapters of Exodus actually are, uh, God is curiously absent. Uh, he, he's, it, it's really. But I, I think that, I think that it's because there's a the direct parallel with the flood and even the, even the, uh, I'm sorry, this is, I don't want to sound harsh, but like in terms of narrative, like I, I if we look at the actual narrative structure and, and Greg, the, the, the killing of the, the Hebrew children, you have to understand it almost as if they're all dead except for Moses. All the males have been killed except for Moses. There's just one. It's a reduction. There's like this reduction. So think about Noah as well. Like everybody's dead. There's just one. There's this reduction, which, which manifests the seed, right? When you, so it's like the story of Superman is this, is the same story. It's like his whole planet is dead. And now this last one, he's as if he's gathered into himself all of the nature of what he is. And now he is going to, He's going to recast it. And so I think that that's, at least narratively, I know it might cause moral problems to, to people to, to think about it that way, but at least why, narratively, why this would is... Why would it cause a moral problem? I don't know, because people don't like the, the idea that God would just let the, the children of, of, of Egypt die. But that pattern of the, ch the killing of the children is repeated in Scripture 
in, in the story of Christ, right, right. and in the story of Christ, right, you right. have you have the same image where the that, king kills the kills the children, and it's it's a it's it's a strange thing. It's as if there's this concentration, yeah. and then it and it's not that God wants that to happen, but that it, God transforms evil into good all the time. That's what God does. He takes the evil. It's not that God wants evil, but that he is constantly covering it with his, with his grace and his glory. And so it's like, this is the worst thing that could happen. Like kill all the children. And then all of a sudden God's like, no, there's one, we're going to replant the seed and it's good. And so you can't, you can't get rid of it. It's like, it's, it's meaning will return. The law will return. The covenant will return. You can't, you can't get rid of it. Humans have no power to destroy creation. To Stephen's point then, because I found the hardening of the heart is very inter- is very struck by that going back to read it, because it's like, why keep hardening the heart, mm-hmm. right? But what's very interesting to your point is, is that in conditions that are the utmost extreme to have good flourish, that in some, in some regards is the story of the ultimate, most condensed version of good. It's the most extreme example, right? Like Christ, story of, right? It's the same thing. So it's not that it's a moral problem, whether whether you view that as being literal, metaphorical, whichever way that you approach the text. But it's it's also it's actually a it's actually the experience of everything. Everything works that way, right? So it's like Greek civilization dies and it's almost gone. And so what do we do? We try to save. What do we save? How, what do we decide what we're going to say? So it actually condenses into its essence, and then that gets carried through to the next, right? It's a, an apple falls to the ground. It rots. Everything falls apart. And then, oh, surprise, there's that hidden thing inside, that seed, which will now, which will now sprout up again. Well, and that's right. And that's in, in alchemy, it's the jewel in the toad's head, right? In Freudian catharsis, it's going back to the point of greatest trauma to find the thing that will liberate you, right? It's, that's, it's not only true historically and culturally, it's true psychologically, sociologically. Well, we, we also, we glossed over the fact that in some sense that all the Hebrew boys were put to death and that there's a there's a structural parallel between that and what happens in Christ's time because it's also an emphasis on the motif of lowly birth Dennis you referred to that yesterday that Moses is the son of two ordinary people but it's not just that he's the son of two ordinary people he's the son of two ordinary people born into tyrannical catastrophe under the threat of death and I will return to the archetypal in some sense there um, in that well, that's true of all of us to some real degree, and we're even wrestling that within our, about that within our culture now, because we tend to view our culture as an atrocious tyranny, and so we're children of an atrocious tyranny. And all of us, of course, at birth are susceptible to death because human beings are unbelievably vulnerable at, er- at birth. And so it's, it's, it's the, it's the lot of mankind, so to speak. And then out of that, terribly threatened beginning can come the redeeming hero and that's definitely what happens in the Moses story and 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 it's the eternal story and it's all ref, it's reflective in that sense of of the of the story that you just laid out too do you do you all agree with Jonathan's comment that god turns all evil into good is that a generally agreed to proposition at this table that's certainly where the the, you might say, the philosophically arrivable idea that uh, God is omnipotent has to lead. Mm. I would say I mean, we're going to find out. I well, mean, that's partly okay. what we're doing. What so we do as for, we live. For the, for the record, I, I've never understood that that line, and I don't mean it at all disparagingly. I, I my love for America's Christians is well known. And the, if the calamity of the death of Christianity is, to me, the calamity of our time, I want to make that clear. But Christian callers began telling me that phrase. I had never heard it in 15 years of yeshiva. That, uh, and, and I'm troubled by it because if it's true, then A, why battle evil? Number two... It it's doesn't it sort you of mean, why trivialize. Not just leave it all up to God. Well, yes, if he's yeah. going to turn it into good, I'm going to watch TV. Mm-hmm. I don't mm-hmm. understand why that isn't the the rational well, conclusion. Well, you, you do see some of that. I well, do look, think I just, you me, see I that. I just want to say one more thing. It, it, it reduces the 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 evil that people have suffered, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. I, I can't tell a Jew who who saw his children gassed 
hey, listen, God's going to turn this into good. Yeah. I mean, maybe in the hereafter that I do believe in very deeply, but you don't mean in the hereafter. You all meant in this world. Mm-hmm. No. Oh, oh, well, if, okay. So in the ultimate the, analysis. Oh, oh, in the ultimate. Okay. <laughs> But all right, so then then I'll go I'll go back to number one. Why fight evil if he turns it into good anyway? Well, I would say for I can't speak theologically. I would say the way I look at that is the same way in some sense that I uh, interpreted the story of Moses is that one of the manners in which God transforms evil into good is by calling on us to do so, and it isn't it without our I wouldn't say compliance. But we don't transform bad into good either. We destroy bad, hopefully, but we don't transform it. The the, the, The raped woman remains raped. Whether whether if if we defeated the Nazis, but the Nazis caused I don't know tens of millions of people to to, to die horribly. No, no. The question is not whether terrible things, in fact, utterly horrific things happen. It's whether there's any possibility of redemption of those very things. Mm-hmm. Right. And that, to that, what degree that, that's okay, So by the way, and I say this with love, and I mean it. I'm, I'm not being in any way patronizing. That's a Christian view of of, of suffering. Uh, uh, so I got to tell you this. For Give me the. Uh, well, what do you see as an uh, alternative, I, Dennis? Oh, oh, I, I, I'll say it in a moment. I just want to tell you how interested I am in this subject. So, I have uh, I have always asked the question why to any phenomenon since my drove my parents crazy. So I always everybody knows Jews complain more than other groups, certainly more than Christians. So that's a given. I, I even have a test: get a, a Christian, a, get, get a Protestant. Catholic church and a, and a Jewish synagogue group together for lunch, an ecumenical lunch, and I arrange in advance to serve overripe uh, uh, cantaloupe. Which group will complain the most? Everyone knows the answer. The Jews will complain the most. Okay, so that's not a riddle. The riddle is why. And I have a I have a fun theory, which I won't bother with, and I have a serious theory. And the serious theory is Jews look at suffering with the following statement. It stinks. And Christians look at suffering as being Christ-like. And that's a the difference in views of suffering which is fine. I, I love the fact that we don't agree on everything because we enrich each other. But I really do believe that the view of suffering is different. The word redemption, as as was just used, that God will redeem this suffering is 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 not a concept I am I am theologically or emotionally comfortable with. May I just interject? I I, I think that that's extremely profound, and something that we ought to bear in mind. Uh, symbolically, so um, I'll bracket the, the theological dimension to it. But if you think of the symbolism of the cross, then that is right. symbolism of the transformation yes. of that which is unspeakably humiliating, mm-hmm. being tied up naked, mm-hmm. tortured to your death, the most appalling death imagined in the Roman Empire, as an image that is ultimately an image of redemptive redemptive yes Um, now there is a very powerful set of images in the hebrew tradition of separating yourself from evil right so one of them is here in the book of exodus you separate yourself from the oppressor Uh, So you're not transforming the oppressor, you're not transforming the evil, you're separating yourself from from it. Uh, And of course, another, I'm not making a textual critical Germanic point here, but of course, the Babylonian experience is also an experience which is significant in relationship to this narrative, right? So um, the reestablishment of um, the, the, uh, the, uh, the temple, in Israel after the Babylonian exile. So there's this very powerful Jewish or Hebrew narrative of separation from evil. Is that to set evil. yourself apart? Exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. Yeah. Now, to some extent, there's a counter-Christian imagery, which is not that of separation, but as it were, of integration mm-hmm. and transformation. Mm-hmm. Now, that seems to me a very intriguing mm-hmm. 
opposition of, I'm just talking about symbolism it's here, not, rather no, than... I, 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 I was not brought up in the tradition you're describing. That was, for me, a one-sided, very lopsided view. And there's judgment. You take what happened to Sodom, or you take the prophets are outraged against evil. Or our Lord, you know, the tomb of Lazarus, it says once he wept, and three times the Greek, he's furious. You know, I, I don't recognize what you're saying. I was taught you should fight evil and overcome it. Uh, that you were brought up more Jewish than most Jews. <laughs> no, I, well. I, I, so this is, let me throw something out to the table, and I, I don't even know if I agree with this. It's just a notion. So first of all, um, we'll bookmark the, the overripe cantaloupe because I wouldn't stand for that. So that's proof of, that's proof of your argument here because I don't know what's wrong with you. Yeah, I mean, sir, that kind of experiment is just unconscionable. So first I want to just have that stated clearly. But so part of the Jews being the chosen people, part of that is to bring peace, right? That's part of being the chosen people. Is that right? I think it's, well, ultimately there's peace because people will come to God and, and God wants us to be peaceful. But part of being the chosen people is to negotiate that with people of other faiths, right? Okay. So maybe having a different orientation towards suffering is part of the role of being the chosen people yeah. to keep calling attention when Christians are being perhaps to a Jewish mindset, to accommodating I, I like passive. both approaches. I, I, I just wanted to illuminate mm -hmm. that I didn't resonate the, to the original point of God turns everything into good. The That's evil remains evil. Our task is to conquer it, but you can't transform it. The, 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 the tortured individual was tortured. Mm -hmm. You can't untorture the person. Mm -hmm. I agree. What, Jordan, we warned you yesterday, 15 minutes. Yeah, we wouldn't I get know, beyond I know, chapter we, three. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> Nonetheless, we haven't got to the I, key verse yet. I just, there's just a phrase here I just want to reread because I just find it so unbelievably beautiful. And that is, and the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. I mean, the claim here that the cry of the human heart, that, that any suffering or sorrow is present to the creator of all things is, a, is an, perhaps it's absurd, mm -hmm. perhaps well, it's idiocy, it, well, but that's it, the claim here in this text right something here. Something at least in us responds to that. I mean, if, if, if we're suffering, and this bears on the other point about the redemption of suffering to some degree, I mean, you do, you do see people grow as a consequence of contact with adversarial circumstances and privation. And I know this, I know the moral issue you're dealing with here because you don't want to justify evil by the good that it might be transformed into. That doesn't justify that was the, the evil. Now, you asked me, or I don't know if you asked me, but you mentioned yesterday, uh, well, you did. You said, what, do I resonate to the notion that Israel was built thanks to the Holocaust? Mm -hmm. that, that would be a good example of what you're talking about. And, and I, I said I, I was horrified by the notion. Right, 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 oh. right. But you also agree that when people face adver adversarial circumstances and even oh, totally. sometimes come... Well, adversarial right, so is not the same a as crucifixion or a gas chamber. That's, there's a finality to that evil. You, you can't grow from dropping dead. Mm -hmm. You can grow if you continue to live. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a finality to the evil if biological death is death. Okay. Once we go to the hereafter, which I'm a, an adamant believer in, then, uh, then, then it, but we can't depend on that with regard to evil. I know that God will punish Hitler it doesn't mean I don't fight Hitler here. I don't think, I don't, I'm, I've never, I don't think I've ever heard anybody suggest otherwise. Like, to, at least when I was suggesting that God Oh, I agree with you. I, but I'm, no, I'm only asking yeah. if God does turn all evil into good, why fight evil? I, I, well, because of this fractal structure, like we are the sons of Adam, right? We are the mediators. We are the ones that God put as those responsible for creation. And so we have to play the, we have to 
we have to become the hands and the feet of, of God. We, we have to, we are the, right, or, or else how is it going to happen? And even in the story of Exodus, right? God doesn't just do it alone, right? He could, God could have done anything. God could have just done it alone. He's, he's like, no, I'm going to choose a man and I'm going to work through him. And then not only him, but then I'm going to have Aaron and then I'm going to have the Levites and then I'm going to add this body so that all of this can happen through distribution. Yeah. It's a, this distribution of, of God's power into, into, into humanity. So I think that that's the way that I see it, that we are, when we, when we don't fight evil, then we are not participating mm. in, in God's in desire. Yeah. God's so plan. just, just because God has the capacity to correct injustice at, you know, eschatologically, as it were, you know, mm-hmm. beyond death, doesn't, I suppose, license a kind of laziness, uh, in the face of injustice in the here and now. I, I, part of our image bearingness, perhaps, part of the fact that we, mm-hmm. the reality that we bear the image of God, is that we, as it were, act as he would act, act as he would want us to act. So, so do you suppose this is, I mean, I've, I've wondered about this Christian notion that in some sense Christ tri- triumphed over tragedy and death and even over hell. And then, because that's a Christian claim, and then you think, well, if that's the case, then what's up with all the tragedy and malevolence and hell? And it seems to me it's a matter of a, a confusion between two types of temporality is that something can be finished in an eternal sense, like in an absolute sense, where is it still has to take place temporally. So the fact that this has been accomplished in the I am the Alpha and Omega sense doesn't mean that we still are not called upon to bring forth the conditions that would make that possible. So... It's, it's, the like seed the, and the pl- it's the seed and the tree again. It's like there's the seed and then you have the fruits that, that come after. But this, in the seed is everything that the tree can be, yeah. right? It has it all, but then it has to actually deploy in time and space and in and the facing all the, 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 the idiosyncrasies that it'll have to face. Mm. Mm. It's a very interesting point, Jordan, because I, I guess from God's timeless perspective, assuming that God is a timeless being, and I think there's warrant for that in the pages of Exodus and elsewhere. You might, Next, you, you, you might say that God apprehends all reality mm-hmm. as a kind of blinding flash, a, simul- a blinding flash of simultaneity, mm-hmm. and evaluates it in those terms, in those, as it were, timeless terms. Mm-hmm. And it may be, though, it's difficult for us to grasp this caught up in the horrors of the Holocaust and, and uh, other tragedies. It's difficult for us, from our temporal perspective, to grasp what that kind of evaluation might be. Yeah, you know, we're still trapped in the pages of the book, even though the book might exist in the totality. And, and in some strange sense, we're writing it as we go, but that doesn't also mean that the final victory <laughs> hasn't been attained. I mean, those are very difficult concepts to grapple with simultaneously, but... But it's plausible to say that that sort of, that's, that structure as God timelessly apprehends it, isn't better, it doesn't, isn't more freighted with value and significance and beauty than, say, a structure in which no moral actions occurred at all, uh, no good, no evil. Right, right. Well, that's, I would say in some sense that's the question of the ethical utility of being itself, is if being is good as God pronounces it to be continually when creation is first unfolded, then the struggle and the suffering are worth it in the I don't know what in the in the total view of things, right, something like but that. This and is a very then we hard run into thing the problem grasp. of the justification of evil, right? But it's not well, a problem. That we run into that. That is a problem. That's the limits question you said, right? In the absence of suffering, there's no limit, mm-hmm. right? So there's nothing to to throw yourself up against. There's nothing to be to define meaning right. if there's not suffering. Mm-hmm. So then you're sort of full circle to is that a is that a cruel God? Is that a cruel nature of acceptance? Well, then the answer to that seems to be something like, well, you have these limits and they're mortal limits and they, they doom you to subjection to malevolence and tragedy. And so what's the antidote to that? And the antidote is something like to conduct yourself in a manner guided by what's even higher than death and hell. And then you can live in the face of suffering and malevolence and and have your cake and eat it too, in some sense. Right, unless God hardens your heart as he did the Pharaoh's heart, then yeah. you don't stand a chance. Yeah, yeah. well, hopefully you haven't set yourself up for that to happen. 
Mm-hmm. So it was too late for the Pharaoh. Well, he was he, a, we're no, like with well, Moses. Let's when discuss come, that when we get to okay, it. Okay, I, I okay, got a different okay. take. If we, okay. if we get to that. <laughs> yeah, that's right, exactly. That. Yeah, yeah. So, now therefore behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Now the restatement of the fact that oppression and tyranny and slavery are intrinsically wrong. Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou may bring us forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, that I should confront the king and the tyrant, that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And God said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? So we can see here that Moses is pretty perplexed and puzzled by the the the, and and he's, a, he's a man who's capable of shame and, and sees himself as lowly in relationship to the transcendent. We already know that. And so he's completely perplexed by the realization, and no wonder, that it's up to him. It's also funny. There's a little bit of overripe cantaloupe going on here too, Dennis, because <laughs> it's like God has appeared, <laughs> right? And God has said, I will be with you. And he's like, you know, he's got all these objections. It's mm-hmm. pretty funny. It's mm-hmm. like, well, I've sort of laid this out well, and there's a burning bush and we've, we've had this dialogue and he, he and keeps coming back. And he's like, well, what, I, you know, I don't speak that well. I mean, we're going to get to all of the, you know, he wants yeah, to so really. So is that a, is that <laughs> humility or pride? Why pride? Well, because it's God telling you, and if he says you're the guy, it's sort of oh, like, well, even if you think you're a fool, you're that. the that's guy. That's good, that's right? good. <laughs> you know, and so, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's another one of those ambiguities, like, you know. You know, what what, 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 what's the old line? You're not great enough to be that humble? Yeah, Something yeah. like that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. By the way, he goes from who am I to who are you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a very funny mm-hmm. uh, well, literary then that, thing. Well, that, that's the other thing that's embedded in here is like, well, if I'm going to go tell these yeah. people that God sent me, it's like, what am I supposed to tell them? And that's when we get into a very complex part of the text, because this hasn't been complex I, I think enough. it's important, though, that he doesn't speak well. And I think that yeah. that's also, because what's going to happen is that because he doesn't speak well, then in many ways, not just be, also because he then become like a vehicle between God and Aaron and the people, he becomes a vehicle for God's word, because the speech doesn't come from him. Mm-hmm. It's not him. And when he stands up mm-hmm. and does things, you know, you, you, but, but then God is saying, no, you're, it's like, you don't have to, it's almost saying you don't have to speak well because I will be speaking through you. You will become a vehicle for me. This was so interesting to me with the bringing in of Aaron because like for me as a storyteller, it's like, right, we, you know, you elevate the storyteller, right? It's the messenger. But then Aaron, the minute he has a chance to do anything, like, you know, is running off making golden calves. And it's like, mm-hmm. so it goes back to what you're saying, that Moses... He's not the direct recipient of the divine That's revelation right. either. He's That's the right. second he's order. The second order. But, he's the second but order. But Moses doesn't work without him, and he's completely adrift without Moses. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's very funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, well, that you, is you, exactly well, the structure, Well, you wonder, too, way. if that's not a uh, representation of the relationship in some sense between the genuine problem and the politician because the politician is necessary and has to play this game where victory is everything and is going to be swayed in some sense by pragmatic and ideological concerns and that's actually necessary in order to bring the prophetic into the realm of policy right you can't do without that you can't just be above politics yeah, you can have john the baptist like screaming out in the desert that doesn't make laws like that's not good for laws right 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 so, and By the way, for me one pace, thing, the, it, it's a very sad fact, it seems to me, we're stuck in, in human life. We want leaders who don't want to be leaders. Mm, that's, that's true. Right. That is so true. That's well, right. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 
Well, so what do you mean by that, that we'd rather have people it, it, The who people who want to be leaders, 90 percent, not all, 90 percent want to be leaders because they want to be leaders. Yeah. Not right. because they want to do immense good and have no alternative right, right. in so their life the to do so. that's the narcissistic and the prideful. Yes, so we want but, so, someone so, like Moses. Yeah, but the guy who's like that doesn't become a leader. Right. The, yeah, yeah. No, it's really... It's, if, if, God, if God appeared to me in a burning bush, I'd run for president. But in the meantime, <laughs> yeah. I have no that's interest right. in doing that's so. Right. Well, it's right. also the... I think that part of that, it's like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle too, because as people start, that's what, that's what I've come to realize absolute power corrupts absolutely means. I used to think it was like you get to a certain point and you just get headstrong and you have all the power in the world. But as you start to engage in the act of leadership, there's so many temptations that exactly, come in. Exactly, exactly. It's even if you're even if you're somebody who started out with good intentions, the will to resist that. Right, and that's the, the acting truth. point. You're mm-hmm. entirely right. Yeah, yeah well, yeah. and you've got to ask yourself too, what do you need to fortify yourself against those temptations? Right. When when A wife. you're exposing well, yeah, right. No, yes, and and friends who will tell you the truth. And you need to be embedded in these hierarchical structures. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. I once had a. Th- I do a lot of throwaway lines. I, I love the absurd. It keeps me sane. Out of nowhere on my radio show, I once said, you know, folks, wife in Sanskrit means she who finds flaws in her husband. (laughs) I totally forgot I ever said that. It was one of my crackpot throwaway lines, and I moved on with the show. You have no idea how many people I have met at speeches. You know, Dennis, that Sanskrit definition of wife. God, is that true? Well, Ben, ben Shapiro told me that the, that the Hebrew word from which help meet is translated in the King James Version. Yeah. So at, is it, there? Is, it means beneficial adversary, that that's a more accurate oh, connecto, translation. The one that means equal. Yes, equal. In, that's right. It means his equal. Uh-huh. It, it's never translated correctly. Right. The right. Hebrew is a helpmate who is equal to him. Mm-hmm. Right, right. And so does it have that beneficial adversary flavor? Yes, because neged also means against. Yeah. Right, 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 right. And well, so, you know, there's a biological principle. Uh, they so call the it, Sanskrit would write. Mm, that's right. That's right. That's right. It's called opponent processing. And if you want to make a, it's pro- partly in, partly why we have two hemispheres and not one. If you want to make a very fine, finely gradated discrimination, judgment, you need two opposing forces. And so, for example, imagine you want to just do something as simple as move your hand smoothly this way. Okay, you can do that. And it's pretty smooth. But this is way smoother. Hmm. And you do that by pushing against, and then you can calibrate unbelievably precisely. And so if you have this adversarial relationship, then you can calibrate much more precisely. Incidentally, how we've discussed, that's also true conservatism and true liberalism Mm -hmm. as a force to negotiate complex change in a manner that's smooth. Right, right, right. right, Corrupted, it's a mess. Yeah, well, the conservatives stand for what is, and the liberals Mm -hmm. in some sense stand for what could be. Yeah, Yeah, it's the the brakes and the gas. And and then you have the logos that mediates between those two. Yeah, that's the necessity for free speech. Okay, so now, and God says unto Moses, I am that I am. Now, that's, this is complicated because this can be translated and has been many, many ways because the tense, my understanding is the tense of the verb is indeterminate. So it could also be, I was that I am and I will become what I will become. And so it's not only self-referential. So God, in some sense, says he, that he is the essence of being itself. Or, but it's not just being in the present. It's all the past, all the present and all the future all at once. And so here, here's some other translations of that. I am that I am the essence of being across time. These are biblical translations. There's an element of self-reference, an element of awareness, an element of becoming as unfolding, an, an idea that that which was hidden will be revealed, an element of to know the place for the first time in the T.S. Eliot sense, the distinction between being and objective existence, all of that seems to be tangled up in this mystery of God's name. And, and he said, thou, thou shalt, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am. So it's, is it being itself? Something like that? Yeah. Being and well, becoming. The ground of being. The ground of being yeah. has sent me forth to so, address So you. it'll just help everybody, I think, that in Hebrew there's no am. There's no, to, to be has no present verb. By the way, it's very common. Arabic doesn't have it. Russian doesn't have it. 
Because let's say I want to say in Russian, I am a doctor, ya, ya doctor, ya vrach, it doesn't matter. Or, or, or I am Dennis, ya Dennis. Everybody knows you don't need, am is really unnecessary when you think about it. Mm -hmm. I, Dennis, is the same as I am Dennis. Mm -hmm. no, 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 there's no question to the listener, oh, he is Dennis. So I don't, it's an interesting question. What does the present tense of the verb to be serve? when it's, it's not really necessary, but that's, so, however, it's not right to translate this as I am what I am. It really is, I will be uh, what I will be. Th that, that is the Hebrew. May I say though, and this comes back in a way to Oz's uh, point about the uniqueness of this mm -hmm. passage, right? So this uniquely theistic perspective. Um, is uh, that I'd sort of agree with that, but but I think one has to nuance it a bit. And partly, if we go back to the, you know, moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and Moses hit his face. So there's this curious tension between the tribal side of this deity, right? So it's the God of a particular people, but also this universal mm -hmm. dimension, right? So it's a God who is not actually a tribal God at the same time, like the God of the Egyptians, right? Or the God of the, the Phoenicians or the, the, the whoever. So there's that interesting tension between the link with a particular people, but also the universality. The other thing I just wanted to say was um, that uh, notwithstanding all that you said about the Hebrew, given the context in which this was translated through Alexandria, uh, and not least because of a Jew, because of, because of Philo and, and, and Philo's uh, it, um, significance in that very significant uh, Greek-speaking Jewish culture, um, in the Septuagint, that um, passage is translated using the language of Plato. So it then becomes ego emi ho on. So where Greek is an extraordinary language in the sense that having the definite article and the capacity to build participles in, in, uh, in a so rather So what is it way. in Greek? Is it so it's I an, am? I am the being. Mm, right. I am oh. the being, oh. as opposed to that which is fleeting, and so that's how it's interpreted from fly, from Philo well, onwards. Mm, so there we get. So just say, so. So what we get there is something very extraordinary. So of course we're right. You're right to say this is something in a sense uniquely Hebraic. This is the, the great, you know, Hebraic Jewish contribution to Western culture, but it's fused actually. Um, with an Athenian element, one might say, you know, so, and hence this extraordinary. Is that part of the union between the Greek logos and, exactly, and, and exactly. the Christian so logos? So, of course, when, when um, you know, and then of course it's translated into Latin as um, ego sum qui sum, or the I am who I am, and, and but that tradition of linking it in to. Um, uh, this this philosophical tradition with its rather different uh, background mm -hmm. means that in the 17th century, uh, my ancestors in Cambridge, as it were, spiritual rather than uh, literal, could say that they were Platonists because uh, Plato was merely the Attic Moses, you know. Um, of course, again, quoting Alexandrians. So okay, we do so, have so, this interesting so, fusion here. Okay, so one of the things I've been trying to puzzle out here recently with the postmodernist insistence that even science itself is only an epistemological game. In some sense, it's only a Tower of Babel. And their dispensation with the transcendent object is that it, it seems to me that on the, on the Greek side of the Logos equation, maybe, and the rational side that sort of branched into the enlightenment and science, the, there's a recognition of the transcendent that seems to be echoed in this platonic sense that allowed us to posit the existence of a transcendent object, right? Because for a scientist, there's a scientific theory, but the scientist knows that the theory, which is the map, is not the territory. But it's such a weird thing to posit because if the reality isn't encapsulated in your conception, then it's 
unconceptualizable. It's just a transcendent entity, right? It's, it's a being beyond your conception. And it might be an object. It is for scientists. But the fact that it doesn't bear any... It, it, it doesn't exist preconceived by your preconceived notions. And then you refer to it, you defer to it as a scientist. You say, well, this is the way I think reality is, and this is the way it's manifested itself to me, but I will test it, and then I'm willing to be corrected by the transcendent object. And I don't know if you can get that. This is why I thought, you know, with the Nietzschean announcement of the death of God, the death of the transcendent deity, that we might have also seen the demise of objective science, because we don't know to what degree science also depends on this be belief in a being that's beyond conception, right? Like technically beyond conception. I think so, there's a lot to that. And we've got to be careful about how maybe we're, you're using the word transcendence in two different ways. So in the first sense, transcend the trans divine transcendence is the transcendence of space time, of the entire, of, of all reality mm -hmm. distinct from God himself. But then you moved into talking about transcendence in the sense of what transcends our perceptual and cognitive right. capacities as the scientific inquirer. I think scientific inquiry is always sort of hedged in. We, we, you know, we can't jump outside our conceptual skin. We can't jump outside our perceptual skin, our, our, our linguistic skin. This is the strategy that the or, structuralists. Or we can't jump outside our a priori conceptions of space and time. That might also be epistemological, right? Uh, yeah, I've certainly can't, can't thought that, yeah, that, yeah. that space and time are like goggles and they're, right, not, they're right. not, not kind of realities. Um, and, and we could probably part that one for, for now, but there are other senses in which science does need genuinely transcendent reality to appeal to genuinely transcendent realities. A good example would be mathematics. Mm -hmm. um, the more sci it's not as if the more scientific discoveries we make, the less mathematical those conclusions are becoming. Um, science is increasingly freighted with mathematics. In fact, a lot of physics now just is mathematics because, as it were, our ability to do physics through mathematics outstrips our techno technological capacity to, 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 as it were, well, and our embodied capacity to grasp it as well. Absolutely right. But we are appealing there to a domain that is not outside space, it's outside time, that exists necessarily, it exists no matter what. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is a precondition of well, successful scientific well, inquiry yeah, that's not the, open to being constructed. There's other preconditions or, too that seem to unite the belief in a transcendent deity with the belief in a transcendent object. If the purpose of the scientific inquiry and the pursuit of truth in that direction is to improve the lot of mankind rather than to make us miserable slaves, let's say, or to reduce the earth to radioactive ashes, then an ethic is guiding the scientific enterprise. And so this is something I really learned from Jung. And, and I think all the work that's been done recently on the, the uh, what would you call it, the necessary ethical framing of attention points in the same direction is that if you don't approach the object with a relationship with God in mind, then what the, the wisdom the object reveals to you can easily be put to hellish purposes. Yeah, well, I, I think you made this point in your Genesis lectures that there is real warrant in, in Genesis and in, in Exodus 2 for tying to the marriage of goodness and being, that the two are uh, really the same thing. We talk about good and we talk, we talk about goodness and we talk about being, but they are really, in the, in the classical tradition, certainly in the monotheistic tradition, these are two aspects of the same thing. And so that might just to connect, it, good. To, 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 to connect it to your thought that scientific inquiry in rendering being and reality more intelligible mm -hmm. is itself a, a disclosure, a rendering of, of, of goodness itself. Yeah. Well, and so that's, that's something we, we almost, hope. That's almost like that's another asana that's to be brought into symphonic alignment. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes, that's a good good way of putting and, it. And, yeah, a greater and, attunement to the way. Uh, uh, and mathematic uh, mathematics can be that, right? Mm -hmm. Scientific inquiry can be that. They're all. It can be beautiful, mm -hmm. even though it's immaterial. And they have to keep engaging for alignment, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. with something else. Well, or or we get discordance and trouble. Those those are the alternatives. So, I also want to just bring up the the it's beautiful way you put that, James. That the this revelation of being itself is then also revealed as good in its transcendence. And here you have God as a, as a, as a verb, however that verb might be rendered, not an object, not a, not a river, not a, not a, not a, not a cow or a tree or, or the sun or, or whatever, but, a, or but as, a, spirit. as a, as a verb, uh, as a, as a transcendent, you might say, activity that is in all things. And yet 
in that goodness, that goodness is particular. It's a, it's a, it's a transcendent activity that, that here in this text right here is said to, to, to care for human life. You know, they heard the cry of the Egyptians. And, and I, I don't want to read this, this text through the New Testament, but it does seem to me that what's being suggested here is very similar to, you know, the, the lilies of the valley and the, this, this not a sparrow, not a, not a lash lost, as Hopkins puts it. And so what you have here, in some sense, what I want to ask the table here is what you have here is, that, is something like the suggestion that God is revealed as love. I mean, in this, in this specific, I, well, well, how else are you supposed to understand the, that? Well, yeah, well, when I, when you were speaking about that, I was thinking, well, What's the maternal spirit that re, that responds to the cry of a baby? You you can't exactly attribute that to the particular mother because it's not the mother; it's the maternal spirit that's responding, and then that's a reflection of the divine. So that would be a reflection of Mother Mary from a Christian perspective, let's say. And it really is a, It's a transcendent phenomena. What crying brings forth is love. Really, that, and, and so the cry of an infant brings forth maternal love. And that's not, that's not something that's bound in the individual in any sense at all. It's, it's, it's something transcendent. And it's transcendent in that it transcends any given individual. And so then that begs the question, what ontological status does it have, right? And we can't answer that question because we don't know how our own existence and our own consciousness is bound up with the structure of being itself. But it's, but suffering definitely it can call forth contempt, it can call forth hatred, but it can definitely call forth love. And then love is the antidote to that suffering. So, and, and I do think it's reasonable to say that that's, in some real sense, how the God of our, of our heroic ancestors manifests itself through us, is that you see the suffering, and that's what's happening with Moses. You see the suffering, and you're open to it, so you're willing to grieve because of the suffering and not deny it. And and that's the taking on of that suffering. And it's the fact of the taking on of that suffering that cowls forth within you a counterposition. That's certainly what's happening to Moses. I mean, he's having a dialogue with God about the terrible catastrophic suffering of the Hebrews. And he's obviously willing to take that on, even though he's leery about it and no bloody wonder, he's willing to take that on as, a, as his destiny, right? As his destiny. So despite his insufficiency, you know, well, then you can yeah. burrow that down to neurology, evolution, and hormones. And to your point, right, that reaction of a mother to the cry of a baby, right, you, it can be proved out here, but that's not all that it is, right? Because then you're into the train of the intellect that falls in love with itself, right? It's a line, it's one piece of it, but the pattern should be, well, right? Well, isomorphic. You, well, and I right. think it is. Like, we, we, I, I think I mentioned yesterday, I don't remember if it was in this context, but Franz de Waal's work on the structure of social hierarchies in chimpanzees shows pretty clearly that stable chimpanzee troops are predicated on the spirit of peacemaking and reciprocity. That's the fundamental principle. It's not power. It's, and so even among chimps, there's this ethical, right. there's, it's ethical interaction. There's no real other way of, of or saying your, it. Or your argument about the, the ratio of, of dominant to submissive rats in play right. and when they it's will go submissive. It's exactly the same thing, isn't right. it? It's the spirit of play that keeps rat societies alive. But right. that thing doesn't exist on its own as just an odd rat behavior. No. Right? That's all about this asana alignment, let's no. say. Well, and, and you see, well, Panksepp discovered play circuitry in mammals. You also see it in birds. I mean, so that spirit of voluntary association and voluntary play, which is, I think, really, in some real sense, the antithesis of power, that's so deeply instantiated biologically that it has its own independent circuitry. So you see there an alignment, and you'd expect that. Why wouldn't there be alignment between the biological and the transcendent? How could there not well, be? Well, we've lost that, right? We've lost, this is the, uh, not to derail, but our avatars of meaning getting removed from the basis of meaning. We were discussing this earlier. And so we're, we're removing, we're viewing things in their own little um, bubbles, right, right, right? In more ways than just our Twitter That's following. the danger of reductionism in some That's sense. Right. Right. That's right. That's right. our babble too. Yeah. But are we introducing a second yardstick with those sorts of evolutionary analyses? Because it seems like the benchmark there is not sort of goodness or transcendent goodness or obligations successfully discharged, but simply survival, okay. well, success, what I, what, what adaptive I would say value. About, James, I think what'll happen uh, is that as the biological view of what constitutes 
appropriate strategies for survival expands, it will increasingly detail with the ethical requirements. Because, well, for example, what DeWall has found out is that just, and this is a step in that direction, is that, well, it's not dominance that, that makes for social organization. It's something like reciprocity. And, and you might say, well, it's still too narrow to construe that as something only in the service of the propagation of genes, which is how Dawkins would look at it. And I would say, well, what do we know about genes? They're really, really complicated, and God only knows what they're up to. And so, as the biological vision expands, and the theological vision expands, they're likely, they're yeah, likely I think to we dovetail. Can, we can at least say that genes don't exercise morally significant free agency, and therefore don't bring about actions that we could give, we could evaluate in, in, in a moral way. Um, the, the idea, we, I think that the, the word survival is probably the bad, it's a bad word in this context, because it if you use the term the the continuation of being mm -hmm. let's use that word instead mm -hmm. that is what what makes being yeah, continue good. and if and if you see it that way then all of a sudden it's not just a question of survival and then this idea that god reveals himself as the source of being and then not only that but then he will reveal to the people this is how you be mm. right it's not just i am that i am then he's going to say this is if you want to be in communion with me this is how you have to act this well, is you, how you, you have to you mentioned earlier jonathan i think correctly you drew, drew attention to it jordan that this human the human the doctrine is kind of human exceptionalism that we find in Genesis and Exodus, that, that, that human beings have a kind of dominion and a kind of power to subdue the created order. Um, that, that's, and a responsibility. It, to there's do a that. responsibility. And that, I think, presupposes that we have, even if that we can ex think of ethical requirements at the sort of, in the non human sense, there is some sort of special ethical requirement, oh, special I kind of moral agency true. that I, is I that most, qualitatively distinct and puts us at the, at the apex, would, as it would, were. would also agree with that. Well, certainly. Mm. Certainly, it's clearly the case that we are self-conscious in a way that other animals aren't. And, and the way that's explained is that we bear the image of God. That is to say, mm. the explanation is given is that there is some aspect of us that is not biological. Well, God is, God is also here. He knows that he is that he is. Mm. And so do we. Well, right? I think we, we have that self-reflexiveness that point, seems Rabbi to be part Heschel of... Says we got to, humans always have to be fully understood upwards mm -hmm. and, isn't and that never there, just downwards. Right, right. And isn't that there as well in that, that point you made about, I don't know who it was now, but about, you know, where Moses says, am I, you know, who am I, who am I, mm -hmm. who am I? and then, um, you know, God says, well, I am. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and so there's a, is there not there a sense of the, the, the yearning and yes. linked to that question of, well, who in the human soul, right? The desiderium naturale, this, this natural yearning, mm -hmm. which is the problem for the naturalist, I would say, mm -hmm. that there is this instinct in the human soul for transcendence, a yearning for transcendence, which we find depicted mm -hmm. in this um, in this passage of that desire for something ultimate, for something ultimately good, ultimately true. You know, and there's a literature on voluntary psychedelic use among animals. So even as low as flies. So yeah, and there's quite a developed literature. And so that yearning for the transcendent might, I mean, it's particularly, what would you say, magnified in the human case, but that seems to be reflected at nervous system levels, way down the chain of complexity. I, I it's a really back, fascinating thing. I go back often to that study they did with groundhogs that were risking to alert when a predator was near, at risk of themselves. And then they saw that their, their immediate progeny weren't in the area of risk, and they couldn't figure out why they were risking themselves. It's like, was this some great heroic act? Mm -hmm. What they figured out is with whatever the specified range was of mm -hmm. risk, if there was enough cousins that could constitute one half of the DNA of a of a of offspring, then it would alert. Like they knew at all times from from scent and by orientation in the community what would How constitute. How they were situated that. socially. Well, That's right. we and know so that. just real quick, yeah. just to finish the point, but so just because they're that's basically is like a hero's calling right to go forth on the benefit of the community and just because that happens to be something that's encoded genetically doesn't make that any less 
right? So how is it encoded genetically, right? We get back to your mm. the question that Jonathan keeps kind of poking at, that if everything everything goes back, it's like, which is the seed and which is the tree, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. If the genetic coding is the same thing as a hero's journey to go out, to go forth at risk, uh, to endeavor voluntarily into the face mm. of a risk that could well, devour you. Well, you see that reflected in the Abrahamic call. I mean, Abraham is called out to this great adventure, but God tells him, forthrightly that his descendants will outnumber the stars. And so you say, well, there's, there's an alignment there between the divine call to adventure and reproductive success in the most blatant literary, in, in the most blatant mm-hmm. literary sense. But, but Abraham is free to refuse and it's morally praiseworthy that he, that he accepts mm-hmm. and that he accepts mm-hmm. his destiny. And mm-hmm. I think that, that's, that's very significant, that mm-hmm. uh, there must be something that transcends in, a, in human agency or in any morally significant uh, act that there must be something in the agent that transcends determinism, that just transcends whether it's genetic or, well, or I think environmental. There, well, there has yeah. to be in some mm. sense, because you can't, I think one of the conversation, one of the um, consequences of my conversation with Roger Penrose, assuming Penrose is right, and he's been right a lot about a lot of things, is that an, a system cannot exist in a universe constituted like ours that's only deterministic because the horizon of the future is literally not deterministic. You cannot compute the horizon of the future algorithmically. Now, I know people who would dispute that, but but Penrose isn't one of yeah. them, so you can't yeah. say that it, it's not it, a scientific it's, it's controversial. It's a very good argument against computational theories of, of mind. Right, and that's, and that's, yeah. uh, yes, and that's really what he's but focusing the on. Other conclu- the other view is more Could controversial. I, at the risk of being simplistic, Bring it back again to the uniqueness of the story and the immensity of what happens here. And this is a world-shaking incident for certain reasons. I mean, every time I go to Cairo, I look at the Great Pyramid of Khufu. It's incredible. And it had been there a thousand years before Moses. How the dickens? If I said to you, Greg, I want you to free the Uyghurs. Mm. I mean, something like that is what he's being called to. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. he's got a confused identity. He's got a slavish people. Mm -hmm. He's got an impossible regime to overcome, the longest lasting one in all human civilizations Mm -hmm. and one of the most powerful. And And only the immensity of who he meets here is enough for it. To call him to that. Well, and he doesn't just free the Hebrews from the Egyptians. He frees sequential multiple generations of people over a span of 2,000 years from whatever tyrant happens to oppress them. <laughs> and that's really and, something. You know, so it's, it's for, Egypt. For better or worse, our, Oliver Cromwell says, Exodus was my precedent. Mm-hmm. So, so maybe, You take the Negro spirituals, go down Moses. Right, this, right, exactly. Why does this incredible mm-hmm. text of freedom inspire Polypia? It's the difference that the Lord makes. So There's maybe that's analogous like, to the... To the the, the victory of Christ in some sense is that Moses didn't just triumph over the temporal Egypt. He trans, he triumphed over the eternal Egypt. And we can see that playing itself out. But people still have to do it. And so you could say, well, the Christian view at least is that Christ triumphed over death and hell. But that doesn't mean that people don't have to still do it. That's the significance, I think, of Jesus remarking in, I think it's John chapter 8, before Abraham was Amy. I am. am. And it's interesting, immediately after that, I think it says, and they went away and and plotted to kill him or plotted plotted to to stone him. This is an incredibly provocative act. Yeah, you might say so. uh, Thing to say. That's right. Just kind of an an alignment where he says elsewhere, I think in John 10, that I and the Father are are one. It's it's, it's incredibly provocative. Um, So there's a political dimension, but there's also a metaphysical universal dimension that that is encoded into this strange saying, I am that I am or I will be what I will be. I mean, it's, I think it's quite instructive that there's disagreement and, amb- and deep ambivalence among translators and, and between Jews and Christians as to how we, how we understand this name, mm-hmm. that, we, that, it, that it's sort of ungraspable. We talked mm-hmm. about the apophatic yesterday, the way that, you know, you can't, you can't we, we, Moses is not naming God, he's receiving a name, but even that name is... is, is nice. It's like a strange it, name. It's, it's a it's, name that's not a name it, at the exactly. same time. Exactly. Right. It's, it's right. slippery. Right. It's as if the name of God appropriately can't be fitted into the system of human naming yeah, to our... Exactly, exactly. And we, 
can't. We, we can develop a taxonomy of, of the natural order in virtue of our command to have dominion and uh, over, over nature and to subdue it and to name the animals and so on. But we can't name name God. That would be elevating ourselves to, as it were, yeah, arrogating to it's ourselves. Also, it's so interesting in that regard that it's also a self-referential name because names aren't self-referential. They, they put things in a category. That, that, that act of self-reference does take the name itself outside of the domain of names. And it so, takes God himself outside the domain of gods. Uh, it's God, a black hole name. That's right. <laughs> God is no longer a God in, on, on this right. understanding. That yeah. is to say, God is, is as the ground of being. Well, he, got the, he does name himself Yahweh. Well, the, right. And, and you, do, you know, do, you, do you know what Yahweh means uh, in Hebrew? It's, it, for reasons I never figured out when I wrote my commentary, I didn't see this anywhere. I'm sure I'm not the first to point this out, it means is. Yeah. Oh. God's name is is. is. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, wasn't there, weren't there prohibitions against uttering the yeah, name? We, we, we are, in, in Judaism, you're not allowed to say, you, we, we say instead uh, Hashem, the name, uh -huh. or when we pray, we would say Adonai, which means the Lord, but we never say God's right. actual name. Right, so we name. run into the same issue here where we have a name that is like this name, but is also not a name because you can't even say it. Mm. Yeah, so, well, right, except so, the priest on the high, uh, the high, uh, holy day of atonement. Uh, but even that name is also, it's like a very strange name because it's a name that's also not a, it's a name that it just is. It's like it is. Well, it is again, back to is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's right. It's, it's the ground, it's the ground rule. Being in a way, it recapitulates Genesis. If you think of, of Genesis, the, the, the first verses of Genesis, God is the creator of all reality distinct from himself. That is, mm -hmm. God is the source of all being, all existence distinct from himself. And there can only be one. There can only be one existence, and therefore there can be only be one thing that is identical with existence or the source of all existence. Mm -hmm. When you point out the chimpanzee thing, which, which, which is obviously very interesting, the, the point is, I assume, that acting good works better. Is that, yes, that right? definitely. Well, that so, there's a structure to acting right, good. Okay, it's so, something like an and iterated I buy, game. And I buy that, and I think that's yeah. important. I just want to note, on a pragmatic level, arguing with people who want to do bad that, well, you should know that in the long run, it doesn't work, mm -hmm. is not effective. No, no, I understand. Well, that's God a, saying do not do murder that. is a better way. Right. And even that doesn't always work. No, I'm, 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 not, is that, I'm not sure that's always, that's always true, because that would be to say that human self-consciousness has is of no merit. Uh, I'm not saying it always works, but... Um, but so that's why I said the bad. Right. I, 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 I agree that it can work for some. Well, uh -huh. uh, yes, but, but... Not everyone would be convinced by that argument, even if they believed yes. it. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that yeah. I think true, in yeah. some ways, though, the power of, of a story is to have the long term, right? To have the abstract grounded in the specific. And so when something is aligned, you've managed to align the short term, the middle term, and the long term. And that's the, that's the ultimate expression of mm -hmm of force of a moral argument is when those things come into alignment mm -hmm. and they're way out of whack right now, right? We have a lot of, of mm -hmm. people and powerful groups and organizations are making lots of short-term yeah. decisions and there's a way to try to align them again. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's some of the aim of yeah. this discussions okay, so like this. I'm going to ask everybody to let me go through the next four verses <laughs> because we're coming to a close today and we should close off chapter three. Are we even going to so, do that? Yeah, well, I think we can do that. Um, and God said, moreover, unto Moses, thou, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, he's reminding them, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. So he's reminding them of their tradition. Go and gather the elders of Israel together. So they're the proxy uh, representatives of God in some real sense, gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob appeared to me saying, I have surely visited you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Pezzarites, Perizzites, and Hivites, and the Jebusites, I want to forget about them, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. And they shall hearken to thy voice, remind them of the God of their ancestors, and say that you had an encounter. They shall hearken to thy voice. 
and thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, so now they're on his side, unto the king of Egypt, and ye shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us, and now let us go. We beseech thee three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. And I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not by a mighty hand. And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. That's, a, that's an intimation of the exacerbation of tyranny, I would say. And then it's, it's demise at its own hands in some sense. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall come to pass that when you go, you shall not go empty, but every woman shall borrow of her neighbor and of her that sojourneth in her house jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment, and ye shall put them upon your sons and upon your daughters, and ye shall spoil the Egyptians. So the prophecy here is that not only will the Egyptians resist and then submit, but the, the Israelites will leave under the influence of God in something approximating triumph. And that's the end of chapter 3 and the end of today. And we'll go over the end of that again tomorrow and, and, and pull into the next chapter. And so thank you all gentlemen. And for those of you who are watching and listening and to the Daily Wire film crew and production people for making this possible. And welcome, Greg. It was great to have you along for the, for the trip. Thank you. Pleasure to be here.